Hello, everybody, and welcome to Promo Homo TV. This is my special program, Higher Powered, which uh, offers up stories of experience, strength, and hope, infusing infinite views of spirituality and purpose. And as you can see, my guest today is going to be on Andre Morisot from Canada. This is an international broadcast. And uh, we're going to have a, a wide-sweeping interview, but basically Andre is uh, an ambassador for Indigenous arts, culture, and public affairs. I could certainly tell you more about him, but I figured that I would let him do that himself. I'm going to feature a video clip from the We Matter campaign. You can find more about them at wemattercampaign.org. Um, but it's an indigenous youth-led and nationally registered organization in Canada dedicated to indigenous youth support, hope, and life promotion. This is a, a, a video that Andre did. Andre, uh, the accent is on the second syllable. I'll be corrected in a moment if that's not true. But this is a video that he did a few years ago. It's very powerful. Take a look. Hi, my name is Andre Maurice Morisot. I am originally from Fort William First Nation, Thunder Bay, but I was raised in Kenora, Ontario, in Lake of the Woods. I am currently the Director of Awards and Communications for the Canadian Council for Aboriginal Business. I'm also on the Board of Directors as Vice Chair for the Imaginative Media Arts Film Festival, and I'm also the Chair of the James Bartleman Aboriginal Youth uh, Creative Literacy Awards. I am proud of being as out as life could ever be. I'm proud of working in my community and it gives me such joy to help, to give back. You know, I really want to reach out and speak directly to our young two-spirited people on reserves and First Nations, wherever you are, fly-in, remote communities, there is still a stigma about being two-spirited, about being gay. And that is killing our youth across this country. Because they're not only in a remote place, living in poverty, without hope, but they're also battling against the bigotry and homophobia that comes out of other people who are challenged as well. It's a fertile ground for misunderstanding and abuse and bullying. And these poor young gay people on these reserves are hiding from so much and alone. But I wanna to say to you is don't hide, don't despair, know that you are going to grow into who you are. You just need the years to get there. So don't despair. Being too spirited is being yourself. You are the joy of life. Celebrate your difference. Don't let being different destroy you. Let it celebrate. Don't let being different destroy you. Let it celebrate you. You know, this network is all about connecting the circuitry of humanity. And uh, I just love that later on my humanity is going to be connected with Andre because he has a powerful story coming up in just a few minutes. For their support of my show, I want to thank DAP Health. One of their value statements is we welcome all people, period. Uh, also, right here in Palm Springs, where I am based, even though you're all over the world as viewers, I want to give a shout out to 849 Restaurant and Lounge, longtime supporters of the show. Um, I am a media sponsor of the LGBTQ Community Center of the Desert, and uh, their mission is creating vibrant community by helping LGBTQ people along their way. So check them out at thecentercv.org, especially if you're in the Coachella Valley. I'm also a proud media sponsor of Palm Springs Pride. It's a 
globally recognized Pride Festival. There's four complete Pride parades at Promohomo.tv, and I broadcast the parade live with my team in the first weekend of November, usually. For their support in amplifying my programming across the Twitterverse, I want to thank the hashtag I Love Gay campaign, and I also want to give a shout out to my media partners. So wherever you are in the world, you can ask your smart speaker to play KGAY radio. Spell it out because if you just say KGAY, your smart speaker may not recognize it. But I want to give my media partners a shout out. KK1065 Palm Springs, the hashtag I Love Gay Palm Springs podcast, and GayDesertGuide.LGBT. If you're having merch envy, you don't have to have merch envy because you can have your own Promo Homo TV merch. Go to Amazon or look for the merch link at promohomo.tv. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to the lower right hand corner of your screen. If you're watching on Facebook during a Facebook live broadcast, you'll see a bell. If you click that bell, you'll be reminded of future broadcasts. And, uh, you know, feel free to free to follow me on various social platforms. My episodes actually do broadcast in their entirety on my Twitter feed at Promo Homo TV. Um, very excited about that. Now, the uh, individuals, a group of powerful individuals that help my show happen are the Promo Homo TV superstars. And they're people who voluntarily subscribe to Promo Homo TV for as little as $10 a month. And new in my show, I've added a QR code that you can see on your screen. That will take you to the page where you can become a voluntary subscriber of Promo Homo TV. Also, I often will show a video of my superstars. I'm not showing that today. I'm updating it. But if you go to promohomo.tv slash superstars, that's promohomo.tv slash superstars, you can find most of the superstars, and I'm going to be um, promoting more of them later because I need to create some very special graphics that I do um, on their behalf. Um this is a live show, so if you're watching live on March 5th, excuse me, May, Cinco de Mayo, uh, it's 1.09 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time, you can comment, and I can put your questions and comments on the screen, and uh, Rock is one of my superstars, he tunes in regularly, I think he's one of my most loyal viewers and a new friend, not so new friend anymore, um, and uh, he's coming to us from Fargo, North Dakota. Thank you, Rock, as always, for tuning in. Um, so, uh, as I promised, I have uh, uh, Andre Morisot coming up after this. The feel of cool water as the warmth of the sun is on my skin Is only a small glimpse of paradise You're the essence of my soul's desire Stand with me, I need you by my side I can't imagine one day without your Another one of my goals of, of my work, and it has been for decades, is for people that I reach to give themselves permission to identify and follow their dreams. And I've turned up the volume on my own per lifelong pursuit of acting. Sometimes I've done it and sometimes I haven't. Uh, but I had an audition. Uh, auditions now are virtual. So you submit for a potential job. If they like the look and feel of your photos and your resume, they'll invite you to submit a video audition. That happened for me. I submitted an audition yesterday. It's all part of the process. And when I'm allowed to tell you more, I will if I get the job. Um, but, you know, never give up on your dreams is, is you know, a theme, a theme in my life that I like to share. 
So before I bring him live, I want to just tell you that Andre Morisot is Fort William First Nation. He's an enthusiastic advocate and ambassador for indigenous arts, culture, and public affairs. He's the former secretariat for the National Aboriginal Achievement Foundation and now Inspire communications officer for Chiefs of Ontario. I'm speaking about Canada, of course. He's the former chair of the James Bartleman Aboriginal Youth Creative Writing Awards Jury, Ontario Arts Council, and the Imagine Native Film and Media Arts Festival. He currently is the chair of the Anish, Anish Nabi, Anish Nabi, and I'm going to get him to correct me if I didn't say that uh, correct, Health Foundation, as well as uh, on the board of Taking It Global and the Gardner Museum. He's the former director of uh, uh, of um, awards and communications for the Canadian Council for Aboriginal Business and is currently the communication manager for the Ontario Native Women's Association. Hopefully I used the right bio. Let's find out and welcome to the screen, Andre Morris. So, Andre, how are you? Nice to see you. I am fantastic and uh, so honored to be here. I love the tagline of uh, over six feet of snow hit ho hits Hollywood. I love that because Thank you've you. got just over five feet of sludge sitting here. <laughs> <laughs> you don't look like sludge to me. And, uh, um, you know, you mentioned in the green room before the show that you're about to celebrate a birthday and that you view your experience uh, on my show as sort of a part of that celebration. And and I'm honored to share it with you. I think every birthday deserves celebrating. I just turned 60 uh, on April 25th. And um, yeah, I, I can't snap or I would tr I would try to snap. I can't snap. It's a good thing I'm not a millennial. They snap all the time. Actually, you have to even be younger. If the, it's, I don't even know the names of all the generations. But um, so happy birthday early. Thank you. Now, uh, there's so many things that uh, we can talk about. But you mentioned that there is an interesting um, political race happening where you live. So let me and my viewers know where you live what the political climate is and the significance of this race. Well, I live in downtown Toronto, Toronto Centre, uh, just a few short blocks from our city hall. And for the past 12 years, uh, Kristen Wong Tam, a beautiful gay woman, married to her beautiful wife, Farah, they have a son, she has been at City Hall for 12 years, and I've been a huge supporter. And uh, just a few short weeks ago, um, she decided to leave uh, municipal politics and go into provincial politics and run as the new Democratic Party candidate for downtown uh, Toronto Centre. And uh, I'm just so excited to support her. Because now more than ever, I think we need vocal, politically, you know, motivated and empowered individuals to fight for our rights. Because I think the battle is, you know, nothing ever really goes away. Nothing ever really changes. To me, she represents that kind of voice that I think we need. And I'm proud to support her. So, um was there a powerful media response to that decision? Do you have a, a local media that pays attention to news of that? Or will she need to work a bit harder for that sort of recognition? No, local media, definitely. Like downtown city media, definitely. Uh, Toronto is a very uh, livable city with a vibrant core. And I live just... I live very close to what we call the village here in Toronto, our gay village, uh, which is, uh, you know, it's exciting. And uh, she represents us and she has for all these wonderful years. So when something happens with Kristen, people pay attention. Um, I have uh, another comment and my friend Raymond locally wants to know if Rock is in Fargo and he is. So Rock and Raymond connect on Facebook. See, we're connecting the circuitry of humanity right here on Promo Homo <laughs> TV. 
Well, you know, I have to tell you, I cover lots of things on Promo Homo TV. A lot of them are glitzy and glamorous and on the surface frivolous, but never. I mean, I always have a deeper inquiry in the way that I cover things. But this sort of interview is the sort of interview I love the most, where we can really dive more deeply and we don't have to speak in sound bites. And um, one of the things that struck me as I was preparing to talk to you is um, intersectionalities that exist within individual humans and also how stigma can be tied to each of those uh, intersectionalities and there can be layers upon layers of stigma that people have to deal with. So for example, in the video that you created for the wonderful campaign, uh, you were speaking about the, the stigma that exists for Two-Spirit uh, First Nation people. Um, but First Nation people are stigmatized as well. Now, I'm not from Canada, and I don't know to what extent the stigma exists there, but I do know that in, in the United States of America, that was stolen in bloody massacres from First Nation people by colonizers, uh, that uh, there is a tremendous amount of stigma that's still directed among First Nation peoples. So I would, I would like to speak, I would like you, I know that's a very loaded sort of question, but you're in communications, you're a journalist, and I know you can handle it. I'd love for you to speak to me about your awareness of these intersectionalities and stigma, how you personally have experienced them, and how they have informed you. Well, you know, um, for a number of years, I, I've uh, addressed audiences. I start with, I'm short, gay, balding, French, Scottish, and Ojibwe. I am Canadian, right? So that just sort of like, there's the onion. Peel that away. Uh, challenge has been my middle name all my life. And when I was eight years old, my uh, late older brother and my younger brother and I went to residential school, which uh, I think they call boarding school in the States. But uh, we went to residential school for just six months. But at the age of eight, being inside of that machine, it taught me an empathy and to see the world through a lens that all these years later, I still see. And then growing up, I grew up in a small town, uh, Kenora, Ontario, on Lake of the Woods, where my father was one of the first uh, uh, Aboriginal uh, game wardens, conservation officers at that time in the early 1970s. And the racism in that town was horrible. And there's a lot of it today. So I remember going to high school, grade nine, just afraid of my own shadow, gayer than gay in my head. But what was gay? You know, it's 1972. I don't know. And I remember being in the locker room, a place that I, I remember being in locker rooms, too. I by the hated way. it. It was like my worst place on earth when you don't know. <laughs> right. Well, I don't know what I mean by that, but of course you do. But I, I, I have both horrible memories and fond memories of locker rooms. OK, <laughs> so I'm in the locker room and I remember this. Redheaded, freckled jock looking at me and saying, your father's nothing but a fucking drunken Indian. And it was like you could have taken a stake and put it right through my heart. And I was, and I remember the faces of the other, you know, we were in grade nine, the other young people around just sort of like, but that's where that, that kind of behavior is learned, allowed and festers, right? So all these years later, I still feel that pain. I still feel like I'm that person that's caught in the headlights, uh, you know, of an oncoming vehicle. And I have spent a lifetime, you know, I, I never identified with my Indigenous culture when I was young because I had a non-Native mother and a Native father. And together they were the, and they were a very attractive young, young couple. And they were like the young, integrated, 
couple of the of their era and I never, we never embraced our culture. We were trying so hard to be middle-class Canadian, right? So we your didn't family, your family we was, did. your family was choosing to assimilate out of they choice would, and pressure. I mean, were, was it, was it a conscious decision by your family? Oh, it was assimilate? never a discussion. It was just life. It was just, that's the way it was. You know. So we was, don't know if, we don't know if, that happened because out of uh, out of the fact that they were compelled to do so for greater opportunities or oh yeah well uh, well uh greater opportunity my my father you know he worked for the government it was a government job so it was a good thing right it was a good thing i mean they gave us a good life but we didn't identify culturally identifying to my culture didn't come to me until I was uh, in my late 30s. And that's when I went to Aboriginal Voices magazine in the radio project. And my whole world completely opened up and changed. And for the over the past 20 years, I have embraced my ind indigeneity. And it has made my life such a better, better experience. And I must say, it's how I met uh, the wonderful Patty Talahunga. Uh, I I need to send her apologies for not having mentioned her. I've kept thinking throughout the show to mention Patty Talahunga, who is a mutual friend of ours. I've known her for forty years. Wow! Um, and uh, she's a wonderful uh, member of the Hopi tribe, and uh, has been a fierce advocate for so many. Uh, individuals and causes in her life and uh, an amazing human being and she and what a career. connected she connected uh, the two of us so uh, yeah. and I told her you were on the show today and she you know was just very excited I'm not sure if she's able to watch us live if you're watching live Patty comment um, but nevertheless continue yeah um, so it, it was a later life uh, connection and it complete because previous to uh, my going to work at Aboriginal Voices Radio Project, I was in the hotel restaurant business. I lived in Vancouver for seven years, worked in the hotel business there. Here in Toronto, I worked in the high end restaurant business, and then I was uh, a part of the managing team at the top of the CN Tower, which uh, at the time was the tallest freestanding structure in the world. So my office was on the 115th floor for five years. So I tell people I was the world's uh, shortest manager managing the world's tallest restaurant. I mean, you can't tell that I'm petite, but uh, well, I, you uh, can't tell that I'm six three right now. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> put us next to each other. I think they'll both. They'll everyone will notice. They'll know the circus is in town. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that. Um, were you ever? Um, were you ever accused of? Uh, all of a sudden declaring your First Nation roots because of opportunities that are afforded to people. Um, in our country, people are often accused of all of claiming some sort of heritage because uh, it would open some doors for them. And I was wondering, um, was that ever something that you were accused of? Uh, no, not ever. And Did you have it friends? Was encouraged. It, it, this I was going to say, did you have friends that you knew for quite a while that were surprised to learn that part of your story? Uh, you know how we have different friendships at different times in our lives, right? So my friends from 30, 40 years ago, maybe they would be because when I was like in my 20s and working in Vancouver and in my 30s working here, it wasn't something that I that I openly wore on my sleeve because a i was just too busy and it wasn't a, an issue in my life but i reached a point in the 1990s where my family all moved back to our first nation from kenora in 1978 and by then i was living in vancouver so uh they were all living on our first nation so in the 1990s i built a little home on my first nation and that was really, that was how I really started to reconnect 
And then I started to, in the late 1990s, I started to feel this need. I wanted to identify with my indigenous uh, heritage and community. And when I did identify and start searching it out here in downtown Toronto, I was absolutely blown away, especially by the arts community in Toronto. The indigenous arts community is so strong and so talented. And then when I worked for uh, Inspire, I, would, uh, I, I was in charge of 14 awards. And each year I would take a film crew and I would go out across the country to wherever these indigenous award winners lived. So I have been everywhere from Inuvik to Iqaluit to you name it, Baffin Island, all across this country. I've been to so many First Nations. I have seen the richness. I have seen and been able to celebrate the culture and the people. Well, that's it's beautiful. I love how you, how your journey has unfolded. Now, one of the things that I learned in watching one of the videos that you provided me with for research is that you grew up in a part of Canada where one of the predominant languages that was spoken was Ukrainian, which leads me to ask, are you personally of Ukrainian heritage? And if not, I, I'm definitely sure that having come from that part of uh, Canada, that you must have relationships fairly personal relationships with people that are impacted in very different ways than those of us that don't have some sort of uh, familial connection to Ukraine? That is a, a fantastic question, because the truth is that I grew up with other with Ukrainian kids in school, right? Uh, but uh, I grew up two hours away from Winnipeg, Manitoba. And Winnipeg has one of the largest uh, populations of Ukrainian people outside of Ukraine. And uh, one of my cousins is uh, married to a beautiful young gal who is of Ukrainian descent. And I was just saying to somebody the other day, I said, you know, isn't it, it's extraordinary how suddenly with all of this horror going on that we start looking around in our lives and seeing all of the people who were Ukrainian that we never identified as or with being Ukrainian, which I can almost see that kind of, you know, albeit, but, you know, comparison with my uh, indigenous background. It's like we, when the conversation comes, uh, the people are there as well. And yeah, so answer, yes. So Rock has a question. What was the first connection you felt from your indigenous culture? Um, oh, the, I, I think that what he means is when you decided to come out and own your heritage, what inspired you to do that? And uh, do you think that your life would have been different had you done this much earlier? And if I didn't get that rock correctly, let me know. So that's how I'm going to interpret his question. Oh, well, I definitely think my life would have been so different had I made different, the better or clear. just different, different, oh, better, better. Not that I've got any complaints whatsoever. I think better because, you know, I look at my life and I realize that uh, it's really important that we take advantage of the opportunities around us. And I think that had I had the wherewithal to take fuller advantage of opportunities uh, with respect to my culture earlier in my life, that it, I would be, it would have been a completely different experience, but and the same experience. Because uh, what I've been afforded has been extraordinary. Uh, and the lens that I see the world through, like right now I work for the Ontario Native Women's Association. And it is one of the predominant national indigenous organizations in the country. And I 
I've worked now here for three and a half years. And the thing that I say to people is I had no idea what seeing the world through the lens of indigenous women, how that would affect my life and to see the world through their eyes, like, you know, through the magazines that we produce, all the extraordinary work in human trafficking and uh, murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls, all of these extraordinary things is just more of the gift of uh, my culture in my life. Yes, yes, she is wise. She is wise. And and then you've, you also have written for Cubiz. Cubiz, definitely. Cubiz magazine. So the, um, the the core of higher power is um, infusing stories, uh, well, telling stories of experience, strength, and hope infused with infinite views of spirituality and wisdom. And of course, you don't have all the answers, but I was wondering if you could talk about um, maybe some of the darker periods in your life. Pick one. And, and talk about how, how your First Nation roots, your spirituality, your, I don't know, relationships with therapists, whatever tools you use to get through the dark times. So tell me, tell me and my viewers a, a particular experience and how you got through it. Well, my late nephew was 29 years old when he passed away in a, a, a corrections institution. And I remember getting a very cold call from the chaplain that morning at eight o'clock in the morning. And it's one of those moments where your life is never the same the pieces of the puzzle have been thrown on the floor and then you have to put them all back together. At the time I was working for the National Aboriginal Achievement Foundation and I had a deep connection with our artistic community and with extraordinary people that I love and in the indigenous culture, it's about the creator. And we, we can't question the creator. Everything unfolds. I mean, it could have been, this might've changed that or this, but when I smell today, when I burn sweet grass or sage and not you, 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 wash yourself with this and that beautiful smell. To me, the smell of that smoke is that connection that helps to keep me, I like to tell people that I'm on my last gay nerve, <laughs> but it keeps me grounded. And uh, that is the beauty of anyone's connection to their culture to their belief systems. Well, I'm so sorry for the loss of your nephew, cousin, cousin, nephew, nephew, nephew. Um, Christopher, Christopher, what was his last name? Morriso. Oh, okay. So your brother's son, my sister's son. Oh, your sister's son. Yeah. All right. Um, what comes to mind is that I know that black and brown people are incarcerated at much greater rates than anyone else. And that this is fueled by so many inequities that have been built for generations in a world that is filled with colonization and white privilege. And it's 
terrible that your nephew died in a correctional facility. And but I and I think it's important to point out that it is the atrocities of the world that in many ways put him there. The irony is, and I don't know if that's the correct word, but um, marijuana has been legal in this country now for, I think, at least five years. And the sky didn't fall. The world didn't change. Now there's cannabis stores on every corner and it's legal. And that is what? the state was chasing. He was uh, incarcerated because of a marijuana violation? Uh, uh, it was, yeah, for all intents and purposes, yeah. It was pretty, pretty <clears throat> Wow. Well, you know, the last five minutes of our uh, conversation could spawn a television series um, about the, the issues that are all wrapped up in, in, in that tale. Uh, is there anything that you would like to talk about for your birthday present from me uh, that we haven't talked about in this interview? Well, that is catching me for a lack of words. Oh, my. That doesn't happen very often. Um, I think that... What's going on in the world today is very unsettling. And I remember when I was a little kid and I remember my brothers and my sister and I and my father would get all, if there's one thing I hate, it's a liar. And we'd go, oh God, a liar, liar. And all these years later, he's been gone for 10 years, I suddenly realized he was so right because the foundation of a civilized world has to be built on truth. And if we're going to go into a world where truth doesn't matter, then what kind of a world are we going to be leaving for the next generation or for two years from now or two weeks from now? I think the importance of truth in our world is something that has to be fought for. Uh, you know, why did they fight the Second World War? Did they fight it so that somebody could be the king of the hill? Or did they fight it so that freedom could be built on truth? And I think that everybody out there needs to understand the importance of democracy, the importance of voting, the importance of truth. It doesn't matter what your culture is, what your traditions are, but are you telling the truth? Are you telling the truth? Are you listening to the truth? So that's my little boom. It's like, people, wake up, look for the truth. And you know, at least here on, on your show, you know, you're giving people an opportunity to tell the truth, if they so choose. Everything I've told you, it's all true, right? So, well, I have me. I have a dozens of fact checkers busy in the other room. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I have a huge crew here. Um, <laughs> all right, so there is one question that um, that I have for you uh, that I haven't asked, um, and that is it's not a surprise. I'm mean, it's like not an aha moment or anything. Gotcha. It's 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 um it's literally just something that has come up. For me as I've listened to you and in your view has Canada as a nation owned its own history related to colonization and, and uh, the horrors of it and the outcomes from it I would say they're trying harder than the but US. What happens in this country is every few years they have a big special panel on something or, you know, an inquiry or something. And then they get 
tons of big tomes of books and recommendations, and then they don't do a damn thing about it. And the years just go on and the same people continue to play the same games. But I think that there is an enlightenment that is happening. I feel a sense of hope in this country because people are changing. The narrative is changing. And it really has been just in the past 10, five years where things I think are changing. Other people might say, no, 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 no. But I say, yes, I've, I'm, I'm optimistic about that. I think that uh, Canada is trying. And for that, I think every Canadian deserves a bit of applause for at least trying and opening their minds and their hearts. Well, from my perspective, uh, from what I know, which isn't extensive, but from what I know, Canada is doing a much better job than the United States across the board on all these issues. And there are many uh, indicators of that, um, not the least of which is Canada's um, long-standing tradition of embracing um, immigrants. Um, I, I see Canada and think it has a long-standing tradition of welcoming immigrants. Do you think that's an accurate perspective? Oh, definitely. Definitely. Well, but when you speak of uh, Canada having the tradition, long-standing tradition of welcoming immigrants, uh, I completely agree. But I think that one of the challenges is that when uh, uh, immigrant populations come to Canada and they're welcomed, but it's when the institutionalized racism, when they get caught up in it as well. And then again, the Indigenous people are left at the sideline. So that's where I think uh, that kind of, if we can change those ideas at the beginning of the welcoming, I think it makes, makes it a better and stronger country. Without me trying to offend anyone, I didn't. Well, well sure, and I like to, that's why I couched my question by saying, from my perspective and understanding, and, and I wanted you to touch bases and sort of check whether or not I have a, an ad adequate perspective. So wh where I'm left in terms of our conversation is that it's really easy to identify problems, but it's not so easy to identify the solutions. And it's beautiful when someone like you has lived their life that's about finding those solutions. Yeah, well, I think that we we start searching for the solutions for our interior self, right? And to do whatever we can to make, uh, like I, I say, like for the past 20 years, I've worked in so, so many different jobs where uh, I was working with awards at the National Aboriginal Achievement Foundation, Inspire. Then I worked uh, on the awards for the Canadian Council for Aboriginal Business. And I just feel like I've spent a major part of my life celebrating people's lives. So when you go to work and you're celebrating the lives of others, if you're helping somebody else, I think that makes your life, a, uh, it makes it, it makes it better. Well, I'm so excited that we had the opportunity to have this conversation and that Patty Talahanga brought us together. And uh, former Miss Hopi, former Miss Indian Flagstaff and those are the accolades she had 40 years ago. And of course, she has is living a whole life since then. But uh, it's an honor to meet you here. Well, I just want to say a chima gwech to you, my friend. Um, this has been really, really wonderful. I uh, fully respect and appreciate your honesty and your line of questioning. You've brought me out and made me be true to myself. Well, I didn't have to make you be true to yourself. You do that pretty good. But I just frankly never like to go into a conversation that's preconceived. I love to see how it unfolds and flows. 
Um, so I appreciate your trust in me to allow that to happen. And uh, I hope I get to meet you in person one day. Indeed. I love Palm Springs. <laughs> well, and I've been to I've been to Toronto. I was a guest of Tourism Montreal. Uh -huh. And uh, I've been to Toronto once. And I've also been to uh, Quebec in both summer and winter. And um, I've been featuring comments throughout uh, the broadcast, but the final one is from Raymond, who says, thank you, Andre and Nicholas Snow. Th thank you, Raymond, for your support. And thank you, Andre, for being on the show. Wonderful. Thank you so much. If you hang tight, I'll speak with you briefly in the green room. You bet. So there you have it, a wonderful conversation with Andre Morisot. I've really enjoyed myself, and I hope that you have too. Um, and I encourage you to share this broadcast to your friends, family, and cohorts. And uh, uh, that's what I love about when one of these conversations exists digitally, it exists forever. And all of our, all of, all of us live on in a, in a, anytime we create with intention conversations that are about raising consciousness, we have an eternal impact, especially in the digital age. So wherever you are, I encourage you to honor and follow your dreams this day. And uh, I will see you next time.